A while back I did a video about this all-in-one cassette and 8-track stereo system, which I called the 1970s in a box. Now I present to you the 1970s in an even bigger box. Wow, this thing is bigger than a Nakamichi Dragon and has more buttons than an Atari Jaguar controller. And look at these beautiful lighted dual analog view meters. It also has a peak indicator LED and an animated tape running display. You know, things with uh, bouncing needles, flashing LEDs, that kind of stuff. It also has a real metal faceplate and a soft eject cassette door with a nice large window on it. And on the 8-track side of things, it has features you don't normally see, like a soft touch power eject button, as well as auto eject, pause, fast forward, repeat, and the ability to record. It also has the ability to dub an 8-track to a cassette or vice versa. You may be surprised to see that this beautiful 1970s era hi-fi audio component was manufactured by Sound Design. But notice it says Sound Design TX and that's important because I believe that was their sub-brand of higher quality audio components. You might be inclined to think it's all show and no go like a lot of Sound Design's cheaper products were but this thing actually sounds excellent. I was really surprised by its audio quality. It also supports playing both normal bias tape and high bias tape, which it calls special tape. The only real sign of cheapness is that instead of Dolby noise reduction, it has what it calls NRC, which as far as I can tell is just a low pass filter to reduce the high end slightly which will reduce tape hiss but also reduces the treble response. But that's actually still useful for playing Dolby encoded tapes because if you remember the liner notes of some cassettes telling you to decrease the treble response when playing on a unit not equipped with Dolby, this button will do that for you. And I do believe the NRC does work when playing 8-tracks, in case you're playing an 8-track which was Dolby NR encoded. It also has a beautiful wood grain cabinet, and this is not just a sticker made to look like wood grain, this is real wood grain veneer. There's the information on the back, it's model number 0868. It has a line input sensitivity of 50 millivolts and a line output level of 500 millivolts. And unlike what you would expect for a sound design, it was not made in Hong Kong or Taiwan. It was made in Japan. And one thing I really found interesting is that on the bottom, there's a full schematic diagram printed on it, which is helpful because I cannot find any manuals for this equipment. Also on the bottom is an access hole for adjusting the azimuth of the 8-track head. And these handles are not just decorative or to give you something to grab onto when you're carrying this thing around. They actually serve a functional purpose of helping to protect the cassette deck buttons because they're quite long. And I've seen some of these decks where these buttons get broken or bent. So this handle helps to prevent against that. And I think this one is just there for symmetry. And this deck has the most instantaneous auto stop I've ever seen. It doesn't sit there and strain against the end of the tape for a couple seconds before it lets go, like a lot of other tape decks. It stops immediately when it reaches the end of the tape. And you may think this animated tape running display is just a gimmick, but it actually serves a useful purpose, because like a lot of 1970s era cassette decks, this only auto stops in play and record mode. It does not auto stop 
when you're rewinding or fast forwarding. So if you're fast winding the tape and it reaches the end, you'll see that indicator stop moving. And when you see that, it reminds you that you have to hit stop. And its rewind is absolutely ferocious. That's not messing around, that's moving right along. It also has the odd quirk where you can pause the fast forward. I don't know what functional purpose that would serve, but you can do it. This unit was listed as for parts or not working, but when I got it, the only thing wrong with the cassette deck part of it was that the heads were extremely dirty. So dirty, in fact, that I needed to scrape the head with my fingernail to get all the dirt off. And speaking of which, unlike a lot of decks where these screws on the door are just decorative, on this one they're actually functional, allowing you to easily remove the door for easier access to clean and align the heads. There's also just a little piece of double-sided tape holding it in place. Well, actually removing this metal trim piece doesn't really give you better access to cleaning the heads, but what it does do is open up this little gap here, giving you just enough room to stick in a screwdriver and adjust the azimuth of the tape head. However, I think the 8-track deck is going to need a new belt because when I insert a tape, I can hear the motor running, but it does not play, nor does it change the program. And also when I hit fast forward, the motor increases in speed, but it doesn't sound like it's straining against anything. So I think it just needs a new belt. Well, the auto eject doesn't work either because that's powered by the motor. So if the belt is not intact, that feature will not work. But you can still pull out the tape manually. To take it apart, you remove these screws from the bottom and the whole assembly slides out from the front. The cassette mechanism has a genuine Mabuchi motor and a nice heavy metal flywheel. I believe this screw is for adjusting the motor speed. And the belts are still good. And the 8-track mechanism uses a Nippon audio motor. And the only thing I can find that looks like a date code is on the power transformer. It says 8131. So this could possibly have been built in 1981 but it clearly looks like a 1970s design. And looking at the glazing on the pinch roller of the cassette deck, it's obvious it was quite heavily used in its life. And that's not something you can just clean off. I would need to try to resurface this pinch roller, although it doesn't seem to affect its performance in any way. The speed seems to be stable and correct. And underneath I can see the belt on the 8-track mechanism is rather loose, so I'll replace it. Looks like I'll need to remove this large wheel here to gain access to it. There's a little clip holding it on. I don't have any belts of the correct width, but I found one that's a little bit smaller and put it on. So at least now it's nice and tight on there. So let's see if that fixed it. Replacing the belt did get the 8-track player running again, but the speed was very unstable. And looking inside, I think I know why. There's this piece of old chewed up tape wrapped around and stuck to the pinch roller. It didn't chew up any of my tapes. This was there when I got it. So I'll need to try to remove all this and then hopefully it will play better. And here's the chewed up tape I was able to pull off the pinch roller. It would be interesting to try to run this past a tape head and see if I can identify which tape it was that got chewed up based on the few seconds of audio this would play. So now the 8-track player is working again. <laughs> But it sounds like I'd need to adjust the azimuth because I can hear more than one track playing at a time. And there's the auto eject. No matter how I adjusted the alignment of the 8-track head, I could not get it to line up with the tracks correctly. And looking again inside the door, now I can see why. The bottom of the plastic head carrier is cracked. You can see the gap on the left side there. So in order to fix that, I would need to take this mechanism apart and glue that back together. And unfortunately, in the process of messing around with this thing, trying to get it working, my Billy Joel 8-track snapped right at the splice point. So yeah, 
that's kind of proof that 8-tracks are not that reliable, both in terms of the hardware to play them and the tapes themselves. Repairing that 8-track head will need to wait until another time because I wanted to move on to trying recording on this deck. First I tried an ordinary Type 1 tape and the results were not that great. It sounded pretty much what you would expect a sound design to sound like. It was passable but not good. But then I tried a Type 2 high bias tape with the special tape setting engaged and this thing really impressed me. It makes a very loud and clear recording. It has no problem peaking in the red zone. The amount of tape hiss is very low, so it makes a very impressive recording on this Maxell Type 2 high bias tape. Which surprised me because I had to look at the schematic and I noticed that pressing this special tape mode does not change the bias. It only changes the equalization. So I think what they did at the factory is they calibrated the bias to be correct for high bias tapes so that when you're recording on the normal bias tape, it's putting too much bias on the tape. That's why it sounds dull and not very good. But when you try recording on a high bias tape, then it's the correct setting and it makes a very good quality recording. I also tried a pure chrome tape because this Maxell tape is actually cobalt tape. But this didn't quite make as good of a recording as the Maxell tape. It was still much better than Type 1, but not as good as the Maxell tape. Same thing with a Type 3 ferrochrome tape. It was a little bit better than the Type 1, but still not as good as the Type 2 when recording on this. And just as I suspected, this NRC noise reduction is a playback only circuit. It has no effect on the recording. If you turn it on or off when you're recording, it makes no difference. And just one thing I noticed about recording from this CD player, it has such a high output level that it actually overloads the input circuit of this tape deck. So I needed to add this inline attenuator to reduce its output level down to a level that this thing can handle. Because CD players have an output level that's normally around 1.5 to 2 volts and you saw on the back that this thing has an input sensitivity of only 50 millivolts which is very very sensitive so that's why a high output level device like this will overload it listening to the radio driving So I'm really impressed by this deck. I did not expect this kind of quality from a sound design product. And there were not many of these cassette and 8-track combo decks made. Sanyo had one, but despite what you would assume being a higher quality brand name, it actually looks a lot cheaper than this sound design. It was just a boring gray plastic unit. And there was one from Thomas, which looks very similar to this sound design, but it has an LED display instead of analog VU meters. So I have no real complaints about this deck, and I think it's quite special.